Well, hello, party people, and welcome to office hours in downtown San Diego. Finally getting settled into the new condo, so uh, now the furniture is here, so now I can veg out on the balcony with a glass of leftover champagne from yesterday. And it's been a hot minute, so I figured I should probably go in here and take a look at your questions. So let's see here. The number one question, top voted question that y'all had was, Hi Brent, for a f this is from Alex. Alex says, Hi Brent, for a few hours we got an error, could not continue scan with no lock due to data movement on a stored procedure that used read uncommitted isolation levels. He says, I know, as in he knows it's bad. The error stopped when the stored procedure was recompiled. What are your thoughts on why the recompile stopped the error? Thanks. Alex, that's a great question. Here's what I bet that it was. I bet that the original execution plan that was getting the error was doing a table scan because there was something about the parameters that it was sniffed for that weren't very selective. So SQL Server chose to do a scan on a table with no lock or with dirty reads. When you scan an object using an allocation unit scan, I believe it's called, uh, where it scans the pages following the next link uh, to the next link to each page, that's where you can run into the problem of that error could not continue scan, see thus the name scan with no lock due to data movement. And when you recompiled it, just by luck of the draw, the next set of parameters that came in happened to be doing an index seek instead of a scan. So then SQL Server didn't need to do the allocation unit scan thereby stopping that problem. It's a beautiful example of how no lock can cause you problems in surprising ways that sometimes they show weirdo random results and sometimes they don't. It's an excellent question there from Alec. Next up we have a question from no longer a DBA. No longer a DBA says, hi Brent, I recently accepted a security role at a new company and I used to be the sole DBA at my old place of employment. I'd like to consult as a DBA on the side at my old employer. What would be a good consultant fee to charge them? The business is based in Florida. So here, when I, 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 I ran into that same exact kind of thing when I switched jobs, and my mentality at the time was that I should lowball my rate because I didn't feel like a, a qualified consultant. I felt like, oh, I'm not really a consultant consultant, I'm just doing this uh, on my side. But what my boss told me was he said, look, I'm getting a bargain in you because you already have the trust of the entire team, you know how all the systems work, I know I can count on you to quickly get to the root cause of the complicated problems that we had have. He said, you're actually worth more to me than a regular consultant would be. So it's up to you. If you want to price yourself lowball, you'll make it more likely that you're going to earn the gig. Um, but the thing is, you're providing more value than a regular consultant would charge. So it's up to you how you want to go with that. Um, typically, you see for short-term gigs between $200 to $300 an hour for SQL Server Consulting. Keep in mind that uh, if your boss hires a different DBA as just a part-time consultant, uh, then it's going to cost them a lot of money because that DBA won't know much about the systems and it'll take them a long time to get up to speed. Next up, Igor asks, Hi Brent, my friend noticed, <laughs> nicely done, my friend noticed on his always-on availability group that it occasionally changes state from primary normal to resolving normal to primary pending back to primary normal without failover. This is happening three to four times a month. What can cause this behavior in an AG? Is this normal behavior? What I bet is happening is that you have a little bit of an unreliable network. And I don't mean that it's like bad enough that it's causing uh, sessions to disconnect or whatever but just that it's causing uh, timeouts to occur between the availability group nodes. Microsoft has a KB article on how to configure always-on availability groups in Azure. 
It's not that Azure networks are unreliable, it's just that up in the cloud, kind of everything's unreliable. So if you go search Microsoft.com, if you use whatever search engine that you want, put in site colon and then Microsoft.com, that'll filter your results to just Microsoft.com. Search for site colon Microsoft.com and search for always on availability groups, uh, Azure latency, and that's probably gonna get you to the right article, Ar article, listicle, and I don't remember the exact parameters off the top of my head. There's a whole bunch of them, but Microsoft uh, makes that pretty clear inside the post. Okay, let's see what we got here. Next up we have uh, Party People asks, how do I create clean SQL code? My friend's suggestions are use a CTE, avoid subqueries, use inner joins, avoid joining in the where clause. What are your tips? My tips for creating clean T-SQL are to, at the beginning, document the problem that you're trying to solve. In the beginning, put a comment in explaining what this query needs to do. Make it in clear, plain English, because somebody, maybe it's you, but somebody's going to come in later and they're going to need to troubleshoot what this query is doing. If they have a little bit of an English primer, a little straight out, you know, here's what I need to do, that'll make it easier for them to get into that T-SQL. Then, as you're writing the T-SQL, put in English comments, even if it's just one statement, a big old CTE with a bunch of joins to other stuff, put in English comments explaining why you had to write it that way. That will be more helpful so that as someone's scanning through, they understand what you're trying to do. I'm not a believer that CTEs are always better or subqueries are always better. I think sometimes you just have to use different tools to accomplish different goals. And you don't have to say, I'm joining to the sales table because I need the sales. No, tell me why you did it that way so that that way when I need to go back and fix something, I, I have a better way of troubleshooting what it was. Mache asked, Hi Brant, thank you for recommending your 500 level guide to career internals in one of your previous office hours. I really enjoyed it. Oh, glad to hear it. Glad you liked it. it says, as an IT professional who witnessed the dot-com and housing market bubbles, do you find any similarities to the current economic situation? So the, there are so many weird things in flux right now between COVID, between the supply chain problems between political problems that, you know, people always think that right now is a unique time in history. But if you go back to like the Spanish flu or other pandemics uh, or the avian, uh, the bird flu stuff, but just not in the United States, but in other places, there have always been social uprest and overvaluing of currencies. Uh, Bitcoin is a bubble, but that's not unique. And it, some people argue that it's not a, a bubble, that it's undervalued. But if you go back to like the tulip crisis, I mean, there's, there's always been all kinds of calamities in the past. The, the, for me, the most important thing is to know what's inside your control and what's outside of your control. What can you actually influence and what can't you influence? And if you can't influence something, you have to be Zen enough to let it go. Meditation helps me a lot with that. I haven't got a good re recommendation on a meditation book uh, yet because I really just got it started with it uh, in the last 90 days. Uh, but I find that very helpful. Uh, next up, we have George. George says, for the purposes of cost allocation, I need to be able to collect statistics and metrics on a table level that can be directly attached to a single user or an AD group. For example, how many queries has a user got done to a given table? How much I.O.? How much resources? Is that possible without using extended events or auditing? Yes, if you do it at the application level. If inside the application you track which queries were run by which individuals and then you collect things uh, like how long the query took or its statistics time and I.O. metrics, yes. 
I would not recommend injecting that at the SQL Server level because if you try to do that, you're likely to catch things like IntelliSense queries, triggers, ETL jobs, and the overhead is going to be a hot mess. If you absolutely had to capture it at the SQL Server level itself, what I would recommend is a third-party utility that does auditing of SQL Server. Things like Imperva or Guardium that will track every statement that is run, who ran it, and what they accessed. But otherwise, trying to inject that level into SQL Server, a great example of why it's not really cheap and doable is that even SQL Server itself doesn't harvest that. Things like the plan cache don't harvest that level of activity because it's just too expensive. Next up, Future DBA says, I need to truncate a table with 50 million rows. The table is in a database that's part of an asynchronous availability group. What will be the effect of this operation on my AG latency and the size of your log backups? Is there a recommended way of doing this? So, uh, in, a, in a case like this, the best example or the best advice I can give you is go set up an AG, go do it. You've got a development or test environment, right? You've got a development or test environment where you can go and test things like how your AG performs when you do certain cumulative updates. And if you don't, now is the time to go add one. I'm gonna go turn the light on because it's getting kind of dark out here. Now is a good time to go consider talking with your managers about adding one. Where in the heck is the light switch for this? There it is. Uh, but like, uh, is it normal to see people benchmarking or baselining um, how long a truncate takes? No, not really. Uh, there's a blogger, uh, or a, really tweets more than he blogs, uh, SQL Handle on Twitter. Uh, that has done some benchmarking showing that even a truncate, which is supposed to be fast and unlogged, even a truncate causes problems on tables of that size in an availability group. I just don't benchmark stuff like that. Worst case scenario, what I would do is I would take it out, take that database out of the AG temporarily, do the truncate, and then add it back into the availability group. If you didn't have the time to do that benchmarking or baseline, that would be the easy place to start. All right, next up, Mike asks, Hi, I want to work on open source SQL Server database projects, but not Stack Overflow or Stack Exchange questions. Where can I find these opportunities? What are your suggestions? And the projects are for knowledge purposes, not monetary. I don't, I don't have any. Um, I don't have any suggestions for that. Uh, uh, the place, oh, you know, I'll, I'll tell you who I would ask. Uh, go to dbatools.io. dbatools.io is an open source uh, PowerShell toolkit. And it's not the work that you want, I mean, because they're focused on building PowerShell commandlets. Uh, but the people there are likely to know about other open source projects. You said not Stack Overflow and Stack Exchange, so that kind of rules me out. That's the only place where I work in terms of open source SQL Server development. Next up, Z Remote Crowd asks, Good day, Mr. Rosar. Can you quite honestly say that the things that you teach during your classes and that have already been explained numerous times by others and in other sources, or is there something that you consider sort of a commercial secret in your teaching materials? P.S. Your classes are great. Oh, let me, let me rephrase this question. Um, if I, to rephrase the question, if you just read the documentation, could you get all of the knowledge that you need? Yes. People just don't read the documentation. Now, why don't people read the documentation? A, because it's boring as hell. B, because it's got all kinds of extraneous stuff that you don't need. You have to go through a whole lot of chaff in order to find the wheat. C, because it's just written. A lot of people don't respond well to just writing. After all, you're here watching a YouTube video when you could be reading the documentation, but you're too lazy, and there we go. 
And then D, there are things that the documentation won't tell you that are shortcuts. For example, SP Blitz, SP Blitz First, SP Blitz Cash, Blitz Index, all these things will help you get your job done much more quickly. They'll help you get across the finish line much more quickly. You look like a pro when you use this stuff. Whereas if you're still writing DMV queries from scratch, like Books Online will tell you to do, if you're still writing queries from scratch in the year 2021, you're wasting your time and your employer's time. So the value of my classes is that I only focus on the things that really matter, the things that will get you across the finish line quickly, and I try to give you as many shortcuts as I can taught in as an entertaining way as possible. So that's why people actually pay money to attend my classes, as hard as it might seem to believe. DBA Light asks, since I changed companies before I didn't have a, a dedicated DBA, it's been eye-opening how bad it developers are writing queries. Okay, I want to stop there for a second, and I just want to say, I wouldn't call it developers, I just call it people because it's end users, it's DBAs. If you've ever cracked open the code on SP Blitz, you'll know that I don't write queries very well either. I try to put comments in there, it just doesn't work very well. Continues on with the question, thoughts on ways or skills to start to upskill my development team with SQL with a limited training budget? Sure, YouTube. Go search YouTube and there are all kinds of conference sessions Group by SQL Bits, the Pass Summit, there are all kinds of training sessions out there. Now, the problem with that is that there's not a curriculum, there's not a dedicated here's how you go from zero to hero in short order type lessons, there's not a dedicated curriculum to get you across the finish line, and you have to actually watch some of these videos to make sure that they're still relevant and that they're teaching the things that you would want your developers to learn. Because every now and then a client will say, hey, can you put together a YouTube training list for my developers that we can use during onboard new hire? And I'll go out and I'll start watching YouTube videos and I'll get one after another where I'm like, oh, I don't really agree with this one. Oh, this one's pretty boring. Oh, the quality on this one is absolutely terrible. Oh, the demo scripts they're, they're using don't really work. So just keep in mind that your time is what's going to be required with that limited training budget. You're going to have to go through YouTube and find the material that you want. I would be remiss if I didn't also point out books. The SQL, T-SQL language hasn't changed that much in the last 10, 15 years. There are a lot of good books. Itzik Ben Gan would be the first place that I'd start if you're looking at writing queries. For 50 bucks, you can get a book by Itzik Ben Gan, T SQL Fundamentals, that will keep you busy for years. Really good, really in depth stuff. But like we've assessed, as during earlier in this discussion, that people just don't like to read. Uh, next up, DBA Light, oh, again, also asks how, Do you have thoughts on how to in, uh, improve collaboration between DBA and development teams? The tension seems thick. Okay, so there are two parts to this. One is how do you motivate people to do something? And there are two ways you can do it, with positive reinforcement or with negative reinforcement. The classic example that people give with this is horses. If you want to get a horse to move forwards, you can either dangle something in front of him, like a piece of bread or a carrot, that's positive reinforcement, giving him a reward if he moves forward. Or you can take a stick and beat him on the rear end. That's negative reinforcement. And the problem with negative reinforcement is sometimes you get kicked in the teeth. You also have to have authority in order to use negative reinforcement. You can't just stand back there and make threatening movements. You actually have to be able to swing a stick and hurt something. A lot of times, DBAs don't actually have any authority. So the first thing that I would suggest is try to use positive reinforcement. Talk with your developers about, hey, if you ever need help making something faster, I'm here for you, I'd be glad to help. Then, when they come to you, take your time to rewrite something for them, and then sit down with them and talk through it with them in a non-condescending way. 
often I see people who are DBAs be like, ah, this query sucks. Why would you ever write it that way? You have to instead use rewarding language. Oh, that's an interesting query. I see how you got to this point. Now let me show you a few cool tricks that'll help it run more quickly. After you do something like that, if it gives the developer a big reward and they're like, oh, thank you, this is fantastic, it's much faster, then do a lunch and learn with the rest of the development team. Walk them through the changes that you made to the query. Say, here's the before version, here's the after version. And use metrics to prove that your way was faster so that that way you can say other people can learn lessons from this and then it's kind of like an in-house conference so that helps a lot next up Chad asks aside from your hourglass method what are the some of the ways that you like to manage your time your goals your tasks your to do's I feel like if I had a better handle on this, I'd be much more successful, and you seem to get so much done despite having such a hectic schedule, he says as he drinks champagne at 7 p.m. recording a video for YouTube. So if you search for Brent Ozar productivity, I've actually blogged a lot about it, both on brentozar.com and on my personal blog over at ozar.me. The thing that I would distill it down to is, first, make a list of what you want to have done at a certain age, like when I'm 50, I want to be able to retire, I want to have a good relationship with my loved ones, and so forth. Make a list of what your life looks like at age 50, then kind of reflect about what the difference is between there and now and start dividing up your time, whether it's work time, family time, vacation time, start dividing up your time and figuring out what you can realistically accomplish given the time that you have. That has really helped me sharpen and focus my work. For example, I don't uh, sit around and, uh, uh, well, I'll stop there. I could go on for a while. Go search for Brent Ozar Productivity, and you'll be able to read a lot of posts about how I manage that stuff. And I got a ton to post about it. Default blame acceptor. Uh, oh, that's a question that's basically the same as one we already answered. Um, an ice ice baby. Ha 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 ha. Ice Ice Baby asks, Hi Brent, a friend of mine wants to put a data warehouse on the same server as an availability group readable secondary and use this as a source for data extraction. Is this a good idea and are there any gotchas when using a readable secondary? All servers are 2017. Um, trying to be politically correct when I say this. The more work that you make a server execute, the slower that server will be. Just like if I ask you to go and wash my car, get my groceries, do your day job, manage some children, build a career. If I give you a whole bunch of stuff like that, you're going to be crappier at executing all of them. If you have an availability group readable secondary that's bored out of its gourd, why is it being a readable secondary at all? Why are you paying for licensing for that? Move the queries back over onto the primary, but my guess is that you offloaded queries from the primary because the readable queries suck really bad and you needed to offload their work somewhere else. If they suck really bad, then that's probably not a server where you want to add additional workloads. So think about measuring how overloaded the SQL server is before you start adding additional tasks to it. To learn more about how you measure how busy a SQL server is, check out SP Blitz first and my How I Use My First Responder Kit class. Uh, next up, KB says, Hi Brent, thank you for all your free content. You're welcome. Do you have any opinions on SQL Server on Amazon RDS for a production workload? Oh, it's totally fine. It's the same thing as regular SQL Server hosted on a VM. It's totally okay. Um, it all really comes down to how you provision it. 
Um, if you try to run it on Etch-a-Sketch etch -a grade hardware, you're going to have a bad time. But the same thing would be true for any SQL server, whether it was a physical box or VM. If you don't give enough horsepower to it, you're kind of screwed. Ah, let's do a refill. Okie dokie. Well, I can't. There's only so many things I can hold all at once before I go into a refill and then all hell breaks loose. This webcast is brought to you by Domain Carneros Late Disgorged Champagne. Domain Carneros, when you need to ask questions or answer questions out on a balcony, middle of the night, it's not the middle of the night, it's a great champagne to do it. Uh, next up, Kajimal, Kaj, Kajimial, what a beautiful name, Kajimial, I think it is. Oh, it's just spelled gorgeously, I just love it, K-A-J. I-M-I-A-L. That's really cool. Uh, Kajimial says, SP Blitz Cache. In some cases, you need to remove a plan handle from cache. For example, you create an index and you have automatic update statistics turned off. I don't know why you did that. I, there are cases where it makes sense to do that. Is SQL Server clever enough to recompile the batch and create a new plan, or do you need to delete from cache the existing one? Well, Kajimial, as much as I love your name, dag nabbit do I hate your question. Because it would only take you a matter of 30 seconds to find that out, right? Create a table, put a plan in cache querying that table, create an index, and then go see whether or not when you run the query again that the query uses the index or not. It would take you 30 seconds I'm going to forgive you because your name is so beautiful, but your question is terrible. Next up, DBA says, can you talk about using Ola Hollingren's backup solution versus a third-party backup solution like Rubrik? We currently use Ola's, but our infrastructure team uses Rubrik for their VM snapshots, and they would love to see us adopt Rubrik for their database backups. I don't see advantages to switching. Okay, so I'm going to play both sides. I'm going to play the, the VM admin side first. If I play the VM admin side, the backups are faster. Rubrik can do full server snapshots very quickly. The, the snapshots are easier to recover. The snapshots take less space. And they're easier to replicate to other environments. So as far as the VM admins are concerned, Oh, you might hear a cruise ship horn. There's a cruise ship going out, which means if it's the Disney one, we're going to hear it play the Disney theme song here in a minute. No, I don't think it's going to do it. They play When You Wish Upon a Star, I think, with their, when their cruise ships pull out. So that's the VM admin's perspective. Now let me give you the database admin's perspective. Rubric, uh, VM level snapshots are limited to about 30 databases at one time. So if you have more than 30 databases on a SQL Server, you can run into some problems where SQL Server becomes unresponsive. Depending on how they configure the VM snapshots, poorly configured VM snapshots can freeze SQL Server's I.O. for seconds, tens of seconds, even minutes at a time causing SQL Server to fail over for clusters, always on availability groups will fail over, queries will freeze. Rubrik snapshots, and not just Rubrik, but any VM snapshot technology, isn't useful for things like log shipping or uh, restoring specific objects out of a database quickly, whereas native backups can be a little bit easier for that. And it's hard to get point-in-time recovery. Like if you need to restore a database to exactly 10.57 a.m. and 30 seconds, that's a little bit more challenging with snapshot recovery. Usually snapshots will give you like every 15 minutes they'll take a snapshot. So it's up to you which one of those makes more sense for the environment. Usually in environments where we have a lot of DBAs, OLA scripts make more sense. In environments where we don't have any DBAs and we got a lot of VM admins, then third-party uh, backup snapshots make more sense. Uh, Oleg says, Hi Brent, my friend is wondering what might be the reason for columns with no st the warning called columns with no statistics on a primary key. My first guess is that people have auto-create statistics turned off. 
Um, and when they turn that, that off, that creates all kinds of problems with execution plans. Whenever I see auto create statistics turned off, that's one of those flags that tells me that somebody's been playing around in there who doesn't really know how performance tuning works. And then we'll take one more question. Scott asks, when debugging the yellow bangs in an actual execution plan, I sometimes come across a single operator writing trillions of pages to TempDB to the tune of multiple petabytes. My TempDB is only one terabyte. Is there a bug in SQL Server or am I not understanding something here? In order to see it, I would really need to see the actual execution plan because something doesn't ring quite right there that you're writing trillions of pages to TempDB. I have never seen that. I'm not saying it's impossible, but I think we might have misunderstood what was being reported out of one of those pop-ups. So your best bet for things like that is to post the actual, not estimated, but actual execution plan over at pastetheplan.com and then post a question about it over on dba.stackexchange.com. On dba.stackexchange.com, include a link to your paste the plan question. Don't paste it again over in office hours because often when I do office hours, I'm not in a place where I can open up execution plans and really dissect them. So go paste that over at dba.stackexchange.com. And that brings us to a close for another office hour. Oh, I just absolutely love this balcony. I've been sitting out here a whole lot whenever I try to get done unpacking each night. The only drawback of this balcony is that you see the glass windows on here. Well, nobody cleans those glass windows. That means it's left up to me. So I had to get a little window scraper, a squeegee thing from Amazon, and then also have it so that I could, it was on a big long pole so that I could squeegee the outside of these windows. And then I had to tie it to my wrist because of course, imagine what happens if I've got this big squeegee and I'm pushing really hard trying to clean the glass and then I drop the dang squeegee. It's gonna fall down dozens of floors down onto a bystander down on the ground and that's not exactly how I wanna go to prison. So it makes uh, window cleaning a little bit more exciting, especially when I have a fear of heights as much as I do. So thanks for hanging out with me uh, this evening, and I will see you all at the next office hours. Adios. Let's go turn off the little camera, and uh, off we go.